cool. You're all over over there. Awesome. So you're on the other side of Mississippi River. All the way on the East Coast, about an hour from the Jersey shoreline. Cool, cool, cool. Do you still hold? So you are an Esquire, right? I am a retired uh, attorney, so I can still call myself a lawyer, but no longer a licensed practicing attorney. We gave that up uh, nine, nine years ago. Nice, nice. So where'd you get your JD from? Villanova University School of Law. Wow, what made you go to law school? Uh, honestly, I saw Superman as a kid, and I believed in truth, justice, and the American way, and I wanted to be a part of that system. What type, what type of law did you practice? Primarily civil litigation, auto accidents, product liability, slip and fall, medical malpractice, environmental, toxic tort, uh, significant contracts, anything from a $100 dispute to uh, $70 million. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, my, my wife is, is, uh, uh, is an attorney too, but she's on the insurance company side. But she's, I was, she's I was generous too. to people. Yep, I worked she's, on both sides. Plaintiffs, defense, and I also served as an arbitrator, so I saw it from all three sides. You learn how to build something as a plaintiff's attorney. You learn how to knock things down as a defense attorney, and I learned how to see both sides and arrive at a fair conclusion as an arbitrator. That is awesome. Listen, I mean, it's a fascinating topic whenever I talk to – I got – I mean – the reason why I say this is because if you're born Persian to a Persian family, you right. get three choices in life. Right. You either become a doctor or you become an attorney. If they let you off easy and they're like leaning on you, they're like, they really like you, you become an engineer. These okay. are the three choices that are given in life. So my, 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 my dad is an engineer. My wife is an attorney. My sister is a doctor. I got off easy. But, with a lot of friends that I got that are attorneys, one of the big, big elements is that the, a lot of people don't know how much stress goes into passing the bar. Absolutely. I and, swore and, I failed the day I took the bar exam. I actually took it three days in a row. I took Pennsylvania, essays, New Jersey, essay, and the multi-state, which is a multiple choice, except it's not just pick the right answer. It's pick the most correct answer. The worst and most difficult test I had ever taken and I swore I failed when I walked out and I got my results and I had a high enough score to wave into both states. Uh, they didn't even have to read my essays. That is awesome. Yeah, I've had people that I've taken it a couple of times. I've had people like my wife went through the first time. It was like a piece of cake to her. It was just like walk in the park. Obviously, she right. went to Pepperdine. When you go to tier one, I think it's a little bit different. Yep. I think uh, the chances of that goes up. But um, it's a definitely a stress test. A lot of people yep. come out of that thing. They've changed men or women. They, they, right. they, they definitely put it all on the line. So here's my question for you. You're, you're, you, you write, you do all of these different things. I mean, the list on your bio, I highly recommend on Instagram, shorten up a little bit for me because it was just too, I was like, okay. But I know there are a couple of topics that you're passionate right. about and you want to talk. I know nonprofit sure. is one of those. Marketing strategy. Sure. So share with us if with this whole entire pandemic and all these different things happening, what are some of the tactics that, that individuals like yourself in your own field, if you would have gone through this, how would you do things? Like what are some of the success principles that would have kept you going during these tough times? Well, that's actually something that's very easy for me to answer because I apply the same strategies now during a pandemic that I apply in my regular life before the pandemic and will apply afterwards. Number one, have a plan. Number two, is follow the plan. Number three is adapt when the plan doesn't work. And number four is follow through and be flexible. So those are things that I really believe matter. People, all people, nobody plans to fail. They fail to plan. And in the law, I did primarily civil litigation, not criminal, but I did handle some, some criminal defense cases. And one of the things that's very common is criminal defense, if you have a client that's charged with murder, you basically have to uh, the prosecution has the burden of proof. They have to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have to prove you didn't do it. But a good way to prove their case is deficient is show you weren't there. That's an alibi defense. Another one, a plan B, which was popular on a TV show called The Practice. It showed a Irish lawyer, Bobby, who uh, always had a plan B. I love that show, man. I love that Bla show. Blame love that somebody show. else. That's the plan B is point the finger at somebody else. I didn't do it because he did or she did. Or if you raise reasonable doubt, your client's going to be acquitted. Even if they're not innocent, they will be found not guilty. And that's a key distinction in the law. So have a plan and have a plan B. 
and then go back to plan A if plan B doesn't work or come up with a new plan. You got to adapt. Uh, another, a lot of things I say are things that have been true for a hundred years or a thousand years that go back to the Bible and, and you know, you've got to plan, but um, work that plan and things, there's no new things all the time. There's new technology, but certain principles are always going to be true. I agree with that 100%. So here's my, have you watched the, the, the show Suit? I mean, you watch, I'm pretty sure. Absolutely, yep. I mean, some of the stuff that in there is like far-fetched. I'm like, yeah. you know, my wife laughs at it. She goes, that doesn't happen in real life. You oh, can't do anything that. on so, TV actually happens in real life. There, there, you'd be surprised. I was handling litigation, the first of 70 plaintiffs in a case that I ultimately, the day after I was admitted to the bar, October 29th, 1985, I was admitted to the bar. The next day I was in court and I spent the next six months in a trial, first of 70 cases of people who had been poisoned in a lead smelting facility. And, uh, and it, was, um, it, it was just amazing. Um, but uh, I learned in that, in that trial an awful lot about people and about how people react. That's crazy. I was four years old when you did that, Ed. Yeah, sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And in that, the, well, the point that I forgot momentarily was during depositions for that trial, the lawyer for the 70 plaintiffs almost punched out a lawyer across the table in a deposition in a, in a conference room, literally almost came to blows. And I had mm -hmm. another case where with another lawyer in another law firm where that lawyer was shot by his own client. Why I stayed away from criminal defense cases. So here's my question. Here's my question. When success principles come, I, I believe based on what I've been hearing outside, which may not be true, is that a lot of individuals they have this like black and white. It's either their employees or their entrepreneur and they want to do it on their own. Like I rarely see people try to fit themselves in a hybrid version in there. But I feel like for attorneys, you kind of need to be in both because you got to apply the success principles. You got to win for your client, build a reputation out there unless you're working for a big law firm and the case come through. And right. if you're just working for yourself, you definitely need to build a reputation. So I think attorneys have that opportunity where you definitely need to know the success principles, especially Absolutely. communication with people and all these different things. Absolutely. And, and there's a couple of things you pointed out that are really relevant in both the practice of law and in current times dealing with what we're doing now. You're on the other side of the country. I'm in the East Coast, you're in the West Coast. We are communicating and we're not in the same room, but at least we have video. 93% uh, of communication is nonverbal. So if you can't see the other person, if one of us would go off screen and we kept talking, we'd lose a lot of that communication. So adapting to that with Zoom technology, Facebook Live, Instagram Live is really important to see face-to-face, -face, see the facial expressions. If you start looking away, start doing paperwork, playing on your phone, you're not paying attention to me, I pick up on that. If I do that, you pick up on that. But um, in, in a lot of things, uh, you're talking about black or white. You know, here's, here's why my business... Here's my name and nice. it's my name and here's my business card. The logo, the whole card is black and white. I'm old school, but here's what I'm telling you. I bring the color to the equation because I help small businesses and nonprofit leaders think outside the box and apply creativity. The difference between creativity and marketing is, is, is using that in a different way rather than just having art and selling a painting. We're selling words with pictures and so I think it's really important. Life is not black and white. I, I grew up in a, in a strict Scottish Presbyterian background in Northeastern Pennsylvania, where there was the, the white way, which was my family name and the wrong way. And I b joke about that. A lot of things I say are things I've been hearing for 50 some years and they're still true. But I discovered in the 1980s, 1990s, life is all about the gray. And in practicing law, there's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth that you swear on the Bible, then there's the one version and there's the other version, and the truth is some completely different version. It's in the middle there. And that gray and understanding the subtleties and the distinctions, different cultures, you're Persian. Most of my ancestry is from the United Kingdom. There are seven Celtic nations in, in the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, and the Isle of Wight. I have ancestors from six of those seven. The Isle of Wight is the only one. My name is White, and the island is spelled W-I-G-H-T. And my name was spelled W-H-Y-T-E, and now spelled W-H-I-T-E. But the, the shades of gray is what makes life different.
but the color, the diversity, different cultures. I'm fascinated by languages and cultures. I do a lot of business in my area here, but I've been to 14 countries and 30 some states. I've gone to religious services in 14 different languages. Uh, je parle un peu de français, expréhensi deutsch. Uh, no habla inglés. No, I habla inglés. Uh, 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 I'm trying to think of, I do have ma uh, beke arabi. Mm. Which means I don't speak Arabic, but I'm actually learning it. So, my nice. Right. Awesome. So, I, so here's my question. And, because we have a lot of younger generation on our, on our, on our channel. Right? How is this world that we're in today different than the world you grow up in? Because I keep saying success principles don't change, but then right. everybody's looking around and the environment that their parents lived in is different than what they're living in. What my parents experienced and lived in, some right. some similarities, but it was completely like different. Like if they had to phone somebody, it was right. like an event. They planned Absolutely. it, they scheduled it, they Long went over there like that. The rate yeah, went exactly. down at 10 o'clock, you, you call somebody money. at 1001. Exactly, so yeah. there, there was a lot of different things. So based on someone who's got a lot of wisdom, I don't want to call you old, you got a lot of wisdom. Experienced. Experience. Experience. Yeah, exactly. Experience, right. right? What would you, what are some of the differences? Okay, a couple of easy ones. Technology. When I grew up, we had black and white television. I was the remote control because I had to get up and turn the channel or the rabbit ears. Now you can do things. You don't even have to get out of your chair. You don't even have to have a remote. You can change the channel on your TV by your phone. That's one big thing. Uh, music. You know, when I was a kid, I was born in, the ni in 1961. Elvis was still popular. Elvis was a shocking person to the people who grew up in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. When I was a kid, the very first uh, record I bought was my parents told me I couldn't, and I did it anyway. I bought Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin with Robert Plant's screaming vocal. And that was shocking to my parents to hear that music. But eventually, I got them into listening to Elton John. I got them interested in listening to Electric Light Orchestra. My father played tr trumpet professionally for 25 years. So I grew up hearing big band and jazz and swing. I'm, an, I'm a fan of all those types of music. I like rock, classic rock, 50s, 60s, doo-wop, classic rock and roll, electric light orchestra, Zeppelin, the Stones. But then I also uh, continued to get older and I listened to Nirvana and Green Day. I have two kids that are millennials. My son is 27, my daughter's 25. So I am constantly made aware of the difference. I will say this on the record as a baby boomer, today's generation is not lazy and they're not ignorant. They're misunderstood. They want to pursue their passions and they want to do things that will make the world a better place so there will still be a planet for them and their children and grandchildren. So social consciousness is really big. My father's generation was all about being a provider. My father was away a lot when I was a kid on my birthday. He was in California at, a, at a, an electric utility conference. So I missed my father. I spoke, I stayed at home when my kids were growing up. So I passed up a six figure income, quit practicing law, spent time with my kids so I could go to all of their events, practice law part line, time, started a magic business. Yes, I was a professional magician. So I'm going to just throw that in there in case you forget to ask. Ed White Magic <laughs> is the reason for my Instagram is because white magic was already taken by a witch. I do magic only for entertainment purposes and for good. No witchcraft, no, no occult stuff. But um, I learned a lot by watching my kids, learning what's relevant to them, learning what interests them and what they're passionate about. And I try to, to learn the technology. So I'm talking to you right now. I have my laptop. Instagram can now be viewed on a, on a laptop, but we're on my iPhone the SE 2020 edition, brand new with the iPhone 11 technology inside an iPhone 8 body. I'm aware of not only how to use it, but I know what the technology is. It's an A13 processor. Most people that are 59 don't even know how to turn the damn thing on. I actually can tell you the difference between my SE 2020 and my kid's SE, which was from three or four years ago. And I know the difference in the camera, the processing speed, the internal memory and RAM. And That's stuff. your law degree side talking. That's your... Yeah. <laughs> Logical. Oh, yeah. My wife wouldn't know the difference. And here's the crazy part. I'm having a problem with my daughter. She's only like 15 months old. Okay. You're having a problem she... with a 15 month old? All they do is <laughs> sleep and cry. Come on. It's, they sleep like this a baby. One, they toss and this turn. This one is a little night. dictator. She just points fingers and Absolutely. she just says, I want it. And she's not going to have it any other way. So she's got about like eight, nine fully grown adults 
at her fingertip. So she she's already the, the princess in your home. She's already figured it. out. She points, someone gets her what she wants. She doesn't cry, instant gratification. <laughs> Wrap daddy That's around it. her little finger. That's You're it. done. Here's, your my, here's a question. Here's a question. If your son or daughter come to you today, right, and 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 they ask they ask for advice for career, would right. you recommend them to become an attorney or Absolutely not? Nope. I will tell everybody that asks, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not all it's cracked up to be, unless you know for a fact that you're willing to do the law as a business and you're willing to deal with the downside as well as the upside. There used to be a show on TV called LA Law. Maybe you saw that, and maybe you're too young, but everybody used to talk about that because it was Hollywood law and everything was all about court appearances and driving fancy cars and going to nice dinners. Well, as a young lawyer, you don't get all that, at least not often. You're spending time in the law, what used to be a law library, now you can do on your phone or your computer electronically, and you're researching cases and you're writing briefs and you're writing letters and e now emails. Um, there's a lot of grunt work, police work, investigations. It's not all about catching the bad guys. Sometimes it's sitting in a car for 10 hours, eating stale donuts and drinking coffee so you don't uh, fall asleep, but not so much that you have to pee and you break uh, your surveillance. That's, so. that's, awesome. that's crazy. So you would not recommend them to become an attorney. So here, how would you, how would you have that conversation? Because I know so many of the younger generation right. think that their parents should not give them that advice because right. their parents don't make as much as money uh, as the kids think they should make right. or they should have made already in the past. So they kind of look at it they're like, who are you to give me that advice? What would you say to those people? What would I, I will tell them exactly what I told my own two kids. I will support whatever decision you make. I will do everything I can to make it possible for you to do whatever you want to do. If my son wanted to be a ballet dancer and my daughter wanted to be a football player, I'd have been okay and done everything, including stand on my head to make that happen. My son has a degree in cognitive science with a minor in music and a minor in creative writing. And he works as a medical editor in Manhattan and lives in Brooklyn, loves the city. My daughter went to college thinking originally she was going to study fashion design, then art, then business, went back, applied to schools, got in, was accepted, and was a major in business and a minor in art. By the end of the first semester, she had switched. She graduated with a, a degree in studio arts, a minor in business, a concentration in marketing. She works in food and beverage industry in, and does catering and private parties and works at upscale resorts in the Hamptons and just got back from five months in New Zealand, living her best life in a pod on the Pacific Ocean, watching the sunrise before anybody else in the world. And I went to see her and spent four days. She was my chauffeur all over the country in the Northland of New Zealand. And we had a blast testing wine, tasting wine and beer and food and flea markets and, and the countryside. So I say, explore what you're passionate about. Don't be afraid to change. You look at my LinkedIn profile or my resume. It's like Ben Franklin's. There's like a lot of things on there. You're never too old to start something new. You're never too old to learn something new as long as you're willing to have an open mind, do your homework and adapt. And in your working it. days, yes. in your working days, how many hours did you spend? Because a lot of... I, I do agree that millennials are going to, they're, they're social conscious. They want to leave the planet better. Off. All of that stuff, fantastic. I'm part of that group. I try to be part of that group all the time too. But here is the reality. Right. I see a lot of people want to do shortcuts. Right. What would you say to those individuals? Because you, you're an old schooler, old timer. And, and just from talking to you, I get the vibe that you have done those 12 hours, 14 hours, 15 hour days. All is night. All night oh, preparing okay, so for a trial, not that. going to bed. How much hard yeah. work has to do with your success? Do you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is? Gary V? Right, right. Okay. He's a good guy. Well, like. I've, met, I've met him. If you go on my Instagram, you'll see a picture of me with Gary V. You'll see a picture of me with Richard Branson. You'll see a picture of me with Guy Kawasaki. See a picture of me, maybe not on Instagram, but with Paris Hilton. All these people have captured the essence of how to get ahead, and that's Bust your ass, put your nose to the grindstone for as long as it takes. Nobody's really, truly an overnight success. You're an overnight success when people have noticed all the stuff that they didn't know about you before you became successful. I literally stayed up all night preparing for trials in law school for moot court. And when I was a young attorney, I literally did not go to bed. Now, I couldn't do that every night. And I certainly couldn't do that now for very often. But I did. I pulled an all-nighter two months ago. Um, that didn't involve me traveling to and from New Zealand, but I had stuff that I needed to get done. So 
there's only a certain number of hours in a day. I was a magician, but I cannot make more than 24 hours in a day. All I can do is work more effectively and more efficiently and get more done in less time than other people. I have already gotten more done today than most people will get done uh, all day or all week because I'm so organized. Tell your routine. So tell us your routine. Like you don't need to go into details, but like yeah. what time Simple. you sleep, what time do you wake up, what, what's the first thing that you do? What are some of those? I mean, you're in like semi-retirement, but you're still like right. active. You may not be yeah. working for money, but you're Correct. still active. So work, Early, work us through that. Ben Franklin said it, and I still follow the advice. Early to bed, early to rise makes a man or woman healthy, wealthy, and wise. I go to bed late and I get up early because I figure I'll sleep when I'm dead. So I expand the day for as many hours as I need and I sleep when I need to. I sleep when I'm tired, I sleep when I have to, and the rest of the time I spend following a plan. I have a task list. I put all the things that have to be done in my phone. So it comes up as an appointment or as an actual task on my calendar. In the old days, I basically identified uh, four things. There's important and urgent, there's important and non-urgent, there's unimportant and, and urgent, and there's unimportant and un, uh, non-urgent. That whole category just take away. That only leaves you with three categories. The first thing is the important and urgent. That's got to be A, category A. You need to do those things. And my recommendation to people, if you want to be accomplished, you want to be successful, you want to be efficient, do the hardest thing that you will have to accomplish and that you must accomplish when your mental powers are at their greatest. For most people, it's within an hour of their getting up in the morning or getting started on their day. That's when you're the freshest. Tackle the hard stuff. The mistake most people of all ages make, they tackle the easy stuff so they feel accomplished. If you want to do that, I'll give you a piece of advice. A general recommended this. Make your bed every morning. Because when you make your bed every morning, you're going to start with a sense of accomplishment. It's the easiest thing you're going to have to do all day, and you'll feel accomplished. Then you go. Rest. Meditate. Have a good breakfast. I believe in breakfast. I eat, I eat muesli, uh, healthy food with almond milk every morning for breakfast. When my daughter's here, she might cook, cook me uh, eggs or pancakes or waffles on the weekends for brunch. I'm eating healthy, exercise. So my, my strategy is to get up early, get the day started, do what's most what difficult early? and most important. What is early for you? What, what do you mean early? Well, for me, early is six to seven. But for some Go people, on. early is four to five. Um, it depends. I've worked in various careers in my life, in various jobs where I had different shifts. Where I function the best is if I'm up somewhere between six and nine, depending upon how my body is feeling and when I went to bed. And I go to bed anywhere between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. And so if I went to bed at two and I get up at six, that's four hours. I'll have a little- You're a little machine. Little Did you ever lose any cases in court? You're a machine. Uh, absolutely. And if anybody who tells you they never lost a court is a liar or not a lawyer. <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> and my grandfather told me when I told him I wanted to be a lawyer he said you don't have to go to law school to be a liar emphasis <laughs> on the pronunciation so well, uh, he was a very wise man <laughs> yeah. so, so the thing that I will say if there's one thing I would want your listeners and, I, and viewers to, to have to take away from this is despite all of my enthusiasm my wildly different experience as a retired journalist banker lawyer and professional magician i'm now a strategist i help people solve problems by thinking outside the box here's the five things that i recommend have balance in your life religious spiritual uh contemplative meditative something you don't have to go to church to be spiritual or religious you just have to have a belief in something higher than yourself second is your family to me, my God and family are above all else. And then you have your entertainment or recreation, whether that's watching TV, watching sports, playing golf, gardening, reading a book. And then you have um, your health. Now, some people will put health number one, some people number two, some people number three. And last, and in my case, it truly is, is work, employment, vocation, avocation. I believe if you balance all those five things, you will have a successful life. And it's the person that doesn't do what they say is most important to them that has the most difficulty. The doctor who smokes two packs a day, 
the person who says my family matters to me the most and they work 80 hours a week and they miss every kid's dance recital or soccer game. The person that says my religion uh, is more important to me and they're out with a hooker or uh, says that their health is most important while they're shooting up on the weekend or doing something else that's not good for their body. So if you want to do my, my exercise for everyone today is make a list, draw a line down the middle of a piece of paper, put your five areas that I just mentioned on the ones on the left hand side and in the order of importance to you and the number of hours a week you spend doing it. And on the right hand side, put the number of hours you actually spend doing those things or the days you spend or the real reality. Like if you say your family is most important and you've got more than 50 hours a week, and I would urge more than 40 of work, then you're an essential employee or you're a workaholic and you're sacrificing your health and your family for money. And I lived on less. I, I jumped off when my kids were applying to school, quit a six figure job to focus on my health, my family, my kids education and my daughter's athletic recruiting. She played five sports in high school and ended up playing two in college at the top level of division three, went to a national championship tournament in both sports, was all conference in both sports. And the reason she did all that is not because she's the best athlete I've ever met. She's my favorite athlete, but she was very, very disciplined and use time management skills. And she didn't go to college planning to play two sports. She just couldn't decide which one she liked better. So she got recruited for three. She picked the two that she liked the most and she went to the same school and played them both. That is awesome. That is, listen, I'm not done with you. We're gonna do other okay. live sessions. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you, you know where to find me, right? I hope this has been interesting. I will say when I was uh, an adult, one of my goals is to redefine myself. People say, well, who, who are you and what do you do? And I used to introduce myself when I was practicing law. My name is Ed White or Edward J. White, and I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I went to a forum uh, hosted by Landmark Education, which really works I've on the line. Yeah, a successor to EST. And basically what they did is they say, we want you to see who you are the possibility of. And I said, my name is Ed, and I am the possibility that everyone can experience life with the wonder and awe of a five-year-old child. That's what I want to bring to the world, even in business, even in networking, even on Instagram Live. Go through life with that look of awe and wonder in your eyes. If you do that every day, just like Jim Volvano said, if you laugh, you cry, whatever, every day, you've had a good day. Live it one day at a time. Make the most of it because we could all be gone tomorrow. And I'm really glad that I got to do this with you today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for taking this time and being with us. But we haven't even talked about the business side that you help people. So we're going we're gonna to have to do this next month sometime. I, I got too many lives Absolutely. booked up next month for That's sure. Fine. If I forget, you remind me. Let me know because I want to talk about the nonprofits how we can help those people because I think we got to back those people up. And if we can Absolutely. impact one nonprofit, I think we have done our job. I'm, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to do more. So let's reconnect and let's do that. I appreciate you taking this time. Thank you very much. You have a great day and live every day to the fullest. I'll see you on the other you side. Talk to you later, Ed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.